And if histamine is a big issue, then that response to the wine is going to be straight away. And possibly, you know, they're not just going to have bladder symptoms. Beverly Sarsted is a nutritional therapist based in the UK who works with many recurrent and chronic UTI patients via telemedicine. She's also trained with other chronic UTI specialists, so this is a great opportunity to get some of our community's questions answered. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It would be great if you can tell us more about your background and your qualifications and how you came to be working with the recurrent and chronic UTI population. Okay, so basically I ended up training in nutritional therapy um, following my younger daughter's experience with um, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, she actually had um, glandular fever at 14 and didn't recover and was very ill for two years. And it wasn't until, long, very long story short, I found my way to nutrition um, that we began to find, find the answers with more of a root cause medicine approach. Um, and so, and bearing in mind, we were already healthy eaters as such, in inverted commas, we were already um, cooking from scratch and doing all the right things seemingly but it's not about that it's about you know we didn't know about the gut microbiome we didn't know about nutrient deficiencies we didn't know about food sensitivities any of these things and it was when I learned about all of that I became fascinated because that's when we were able to turn my daughter's health around and so that then led me into training as a nutritional therapist and basically since then I haven't stopped training um, because there's so much to learn. Every day is a school day. Every day you're reading more research that's just come out or things that you didn't know about. So you're always learning something new. And so when an opportunity came up um, to um, learn more about UTI, I had actually um, attended a lecture in London uh, six years ago where a physio who specializes in pelvic inflammatory conditions um, and chronic UTI was talking about this and was talking about her research. And so when I started um, working with ladies, I was very much led by her research and what I'd learned and read um, regarding the microbiome and the gut and the, the vagina and the whole of the pelvic inflammatory area and the ur urinary microbiome and all of these things, which I'd never considered in as much detail before. So that was already my, my kind of starting point into this um, journey into UTI. And then um, just over two years ago, I had a client who was had just started working with Ruth Chris in the States um, and told me all about her and said that she'd mentioned to her she was just started to work with me as well. And would I would she be prepared to talk to me? And she said, oh, yes, I'd be delighted um, to speak with Beverly. And we had, we must have had over an hour and a half conversation initially, and it could have gone on even longer. Um, and I was just hooked, um, completely fascinated. I mean, that opened up a whole new world to me, talking about um, biofilms and, <clears throat> and the type of problems with testing and so on. And um, it, it really went from there. And so the training has been ongoing the last two years. Um, which has is, is, is been great because that's added another dimension to our clinic work and what we're now able to do so much more um, than we could before. It's really been very eye-opening and very rewarding. That's so great. We got so many questions today about diet and I wanted to start with some general <laughs> ones. The first one is a lot of people ask if there is an ideal diet for recurrent and chronic UTI. And my question on top of that is, is there really something that will work for everybody in that respect? The simple answer to that is, is no. Um, there are core things that we need to do, but everybody's different. Everyone's medical history is different. And bear in mind that when we're seeing um, this patient population, it's not just talking to them about their UTI because they're coming with, with a whole history of other things. They might have endometriosis, PCOS, fibroids, thyroid issues, multiple autoimmune disease, stress. Um, they may have had musculoskeletal issues, psychosocial, psychosexual issues. There are many, many things that feed into the whole picture that makes up mm. chronic UTI. So therefore, the idea of a diet that's a one size fits all is not going to be relevant. 
there are some core things that we all need to be doing. And that is around an anti-inflammatory diet, which I know was asked about in one of your other questions, but that's more the way forward. And an, and an anti-inflammatory diet is by default more alkalizing anyway, which can be very relevant. So <clears throat> it's, it's these covering these bases. The other key thing is that there are going to be issues with the gut. I mean, we have a population who we already know have issues with microbiome in the gut, much more high risk if you've got issues with microbiome, if you've got issues with urinary microbiome. Um, so those are going to be there. But add on top of that years and years of antibiotic damage, then, of course, we're going to see um, lots of issues in the gut as a result of that. So we tend to see lots of GI tract symptoms. We will see food sensitivities. Those are going to be there. And the lady I mentioned at the beginning there, whose research um, I'd followed originally, and the physio that, that I follow, she's called um, Dr. Jessica Drummond in the States. She talked very much about um, food sensitivities um, and the link there, which is another big topic. But it's these sorts of areas that we're going to be following. As individuals, there may be some ladies who have food sensitivities and they also have issues with oxalates, for example, or they also have issues with histamine, or maybe they've got SIBO and therefore they're following a low FODMAP diet. And, you know, so it goes on, but it's just, it's too big a subject and it's important, it's essential to individualize that care. Mm -hmm. Having said that, are there a list of top foods that you think are beneficial for a healthy bladder or foods that you always tell patients to avoid? When we're talking about an anti-inflammatory diet, broadly speaking, we're talking about the foods of nature. So we're talking about, you know, if it grows in the ground or off a tree or it swims in the sea and so on, these are the foods we should be eating. The problem with the, the Western diet is that it's high in sugars, it's highly processed, and these are the foods that damage the microbiome. They're also the foods that are pro-inflammatory. They promote inflammation. So that's why we're moving away from that and we're moving towards more of an anti-inflammatory diet. So basically, most vegetables are alkalizing. There are some exceptions, but most are alkalizing. So lots, whatever else we're eating, we should be eating lots of vegetables. Um, we should be eating some fruits. Um, we have to be choosing about fruits, but the low sugar fruits, I would say, low glycemic index um, are particularly helpful. Um, and then we're thinking about fiber. So we're thinking about pulses, nuts and seeds, whole grains, because all of these feed the microbiome. And that's really the key that we want to be including fiber across the day, cooking from scratch, knowing what, what ingredients are that have gone into our food and not being exposed to unnecessary ingredients, which can be chemicals, which can be uh, sugars, sweeteners and all sorts. Um, which would be pro-inflammatory. So that's why we really need to be eating clean is the expression, um, but that's really the way forward. So it's eating the things of nature is the simplest way mm -hmm. to put that. And that's broadly speaking, what an anti-inflammatory or an autoimmune diet is one of your, your questions asked mm -hmm. is, is the sort of autoimmune diet approach relevant? Yes, it is because pretty much this is, this is what an autoimmune approach is. It's anti-inflammatory, it's supporting the microbiome, um, and the idea with microbiome as well is to include variety um, as much as possible. Obviously, again, with the idea of the variety, it's all very well saying we need variety, but then there are going to be caveats with that because if, if some people have issues with particular foods, you know, for example, oxalates, which I mentioned before, in the short term, then oxalates are a lot of your foods that we consider normally to be healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are these paradoxes as well, where you, you have to slightly change the goalposts according to an individual, but then you would do that for a period of time and then try and introduce things back ultimately, because, you know, we need that diversity um, and certainly the microbiome thrives when there is more diversity, but that's where, um, you know, working with someone who can navigate you through that is, is helpful because it, it does get messy when we talk about foods. Mm -hmm. Are there tests that you do to help identify whether someone might have a problem with oxalates or other foods, or is it more like a case of eliminating foods until you feel better? Yeah, with oxalates, we certainly would test for that. And there's an organic acids test, um, which is a urine test that we, we would do um, for that. Um, some things are kind of obvious through history and symptoms. Um, and also, broadly speaking, we would start with some kind of elimination. And when we're thinking about elimination uh, initially, 
we would be looking at some of the, the key troublemakers. So when it comes to um, uh, leaky gut, a lot of your um, community will, will have potentially read about that. Then when we've had lots of damage to the microbiome, when we've had lots of medications that cause that problem, one of which a key one is antibiotics, we can develop intestinal um, permeability. So where normally the cells that would be tight closed that are called epithelial cells, they have these tight junctions and that's important as part of your immune system, part of your barrier function. It stops things from passing through that shouldn't get through into the blood system. Um, and it's also relevant to absorption of nutrients. But when that becomes broken down, then we start having pro food proteins passing through into the blood system that normally wouldn't get there. And that's where we develop food sensitivities, common ones being the common troublemakers, things like gluten, wheat, dairy, eggs, soy, yeast. You know, these are the, the sort of common troublemakers. And in the initial research that I mentioned at the beginning that I followed, um, then that was the guidance. That was what they found in the research that when you, you take away those sorts of foods, then um, we can make huge inroads in terms of quickly reducing inflammation and reducing that overactive immune response, which feeds into pain as well. So that can make a massive difference, even without, you know, it's interesting over the years, we did long before I, I met Ruth and was talking about the relevance of biofilms, breaking them down, releasing bacteria, treating bacteria, and so on. Even just working on the gut health, reducing inflammation, taking out food sensitivities, makes a massive difference to pain management because we know that when there are gut issues, there's that visceral hypersensitivity that comes as a result of that, and that causes pain. So when you do do that, um, it is huge, and you cannot underestimate the power of stripping out these inflammatory foods um, and reducing that inflammation of the immune system. That's huge. It's those sorts of things that we would do initially, and that will be a core thing that we would do. But bear in mind, your patient population are going to have, you know, years of antibiotic damage. So very often by the time that we see them. So that's that issue is, is going to be there very strongly. So let's jump to the questions about potential irritants, because we did get a lot of those, and this seems like a good time to address that. A lot of people in our community say that they have symptoms triggered by specific foods, which often includes alcohol, caffeine, or spicy foods. One of the questions that comes up a lot is whether it's possible to differentiate between infection or just the sensitive bladder, like you mentioned with the hypersensitivity issue. Is there a way to tell? Yeah. I think the issue is there is actually always going to be that it's the oversensitive bladder. That's the problem. And in, in all of these cases, or most of these cases, that there's, you know, from Ruth's research, we know that actually bacterial infection is there, is much more relevant than we might think. But, you know, when you've got um, uh, bacterial infection treated and you've gone through Ruth's protocols and, and you've now got clear microgens and you don't have any bacteria anymore, and then you're looking at other things that could be triggering that, then certainly um, immune system response, food sensitivities are going to be very relevant, psychological issues are going to be relevant, trauma, physical trauma, mental trauma, these sorts of things are going to be relevant, and also musculoskeletal issues hugely. Um, and, you know, they, they could be a trauma following a birth, for example, that could trigger mm -hmm. something, or there could be, um, you know, a spinal injury. There are lots of things where those nerves that are that lead to the bladder um, become compromised for whatever reason. Um, so, you know that that the issue with the bladder is, is going to be there for multiple reasons. And when you've got that um, that hypersensitivity there, then there are lots of potential irritants that can just aggravate that. Um, the examples you gave there, you know, with caffeine, alcohol, etc. What's interesting about these things is they're also high histamine. And sometimes, yes, you know, the spicy things and, and, and alcohol and so on um, can be an irritant of spicy foods, but one of the mechanisms for that can be the, the histamine becoming an aggravator for particular individuals. And so we might want to look, um, again, for a short period of time, at those people who are particularly affected by those things, um, especially if they're having much wider histamine-related symptoms, then we might be looking at a low histamine um, diet for a little while just to calm things down. Um, so yeah, so that's a big one as well. Okay, and some someone asked if 
they have symptoms that fluctuate throughout the day. Could that be because of their diet or changes in what they eat on a daily basis? Absolutely, it can be. It can be because of changes in diet, um, changes in pH. The interesting thing about diet is that um, it becomes difficult to navigate because how, how do you know? And, and one of your questions was around how do you know if it's that or it's just a coincidence? But obviously there are blood tests you can do. You know, there mm -hmm. are food sensitivity tests, food intolerance, and also for food allergy. Those are two separate things. Um, the difference being that when you have a delayed response, so if you um, have a food sensitivity, food, food intolerance, we call these immunoglobulin G reactions, IgG, and they can be, they are delayed responses. So they can be anything from two hours up to 72 hours and maybe even slightly more than that. But that means you could eat something on a Saturday and be affected on the Monday. You're never going to make that link. And, and that's also where elimination diets you know, if, if you know the right trigger foods and you take a group out and you reduce inflammation quickly, that's one thing and that's great. Um, but if you then have um, food sensitivities out with the common ones that I mentioned earlier and you haven't taken that food out yet, um, it's often very difficult to pinpoint those ones without blood testing because there is this delayed response. Plus the fact you're having multiple reactions <laughs> because mm -hmm. you might have a response to lentils one day and then another day you have a, a response to butter beans and another day to dairy or whatever, but you, you're kind of all over the place. But that's where um, blood testing can be really, really helpful um, to again, help people narrow that down. Um, uh, and get to the big picture but yes that's another one that we do that kind of leads me to the question that a few people have asked like why some foods seem to cause instant symptoms some people describe taking one sip of wine and immediately having bladder symptoms whereas for other people it might mm. be two to three hours yeah. later can you explain exactly. that <clears throat> exactly the individual responses are going to be there and if histamine is a big issue then that response to the wine is going to be straight away and possibly, you know, they're not just going to have bladder symptoms, they may have sweating, they may have palpitations, <clears throat> a headache, you know, there could be other histamine symptoms coexisting with that as well. So, yeah, <clears throat> if histamine is an issue, then, then definitely. But it, it's, you know, everyone's immune system, everyone's starting point is different. Everyone's gut health is different. And normal, if the gut health is, is good, you know, if we all have optimal gut health, <clears throat> we should be able to break down histamine, no bother. But as we become compromised, then there are issues with breaking down histamine. Another addition to that is that if someone has a history of hay fever, let's say, and they've taken, you know, years of antihistamines, then what happens then, uh, paradoxically, is that long-term use of those type of medications, and there are other medications that do this as well, can actually inhibit the very enzyme, the DAO enzyme that you need to break down histamine. So that adds another layer into this picture as well, where if someone's in that category, um, <clears throat> they may not be breaking down histamine, histamine for multiple reasons within their medical history. So those are things that we always look at as well to try and find what could be triggering for that individual. <clears throat> so it sounds like if people do have a histamine problem, taking antihistamines is not the long-term solution. Does that mean a low histamine diet? <clears throat> It's, yeah, a low histamine diet is not something that you would do for any length of time. You do that for as long as necessary. And what you're ideally aiming to do is to heal the gut. Ultimately, we need to heal the gut. You can actually take the enzyme, the DAO enzyme in supplement form to break down histamine, and that can certainly be helpful. There are other things that, that help to break down histamine. There are also supplements that we use, which are mast cell stabilizers to try and calm down that histamine release. Um, so there are multiple ways that, that we can support that without using drug antihistamines, uh, which present their own problems. So there are ways around that that we use um, very effectively, fortunately. Um, so it needn't be such a major issue. But certainly in the early days, it is sensible to um, avoid where you can or reduce the histamine load. Um, I think what I would say on that is, you know, people look up low histamine diets. I mean, literally, if you look at that online, you'd lose the will to live because they are so restrictive. <laughs> but you don't necessarily have to take out every single histamine. You have to be aware of the key troublemakers and you have to um, 
you know, seriously reduce your, your total histamine load for that day or for that meal. But there's a big difference between having one histamine on your plate and having six histamines on your plate, if you see what I mean. So that you can reduce uh, and, and try and make it much more realistic and achievable for people without being too intimidating. That's a, a good point, because it can be kind of overwhelming to have to make all these dietary changes, especially if there's a lot at yeah. one time. And one of the topics that comes up as a big yeah. one in our community is sugar. And some people say sugar causes bladder pain or irritation, while other people say when they have UTI symptoms, they crave sugar. Can you talk a bit about the association between sugar consumption <laughs> and UTI symptoms? I can. And it is very relevant. Now, Obviously, back to what we said earlier about the microbiome, and I mentioned that how we feed the microbiome is by eating lots of fiber, which is coming from our vegetables, fruits, pulses, nuts and seeds, etc. But the way we feed the bad guys is feeding them sugar. That's what they thrive on. So we're talking bacteria, we're talking yeasts. Then, you know, if you're going to live on the Western diet, which is high in sugar, and if you think about it, uh, people start their day with cereals, which are sugary, they maybe have biscuits then all morning, they have a sandwich for lunch, they have chocolate for the three o'clock. You know, we're, we're exposed to a lot of sugar in the Western diet typically. And so it's very easy to support the bad guys in, in microbiome. Um, and it, it's so interesting that, that that would be the case, but because we are seeing higher rates of, of UTIs and chronic UTIs, and there is definitely that, that dietary connection with the microbiome. So, when it comes to those symptoms, the, the other thing is that when you're in pain, this is stress. This is going to activate the stress response. When you're in fight or flight, what do you do? You need energy. You're going to reach for sugar because you're in fight or flight. So as part of the stress response, it's natural for everybody to have that desire for sugar. But there is another aspect to this in that if yeast especially is a big driver for your uh, particular infection, then again, yeast feeds massively on sugar and also it makes us crave sugar so if we have got yeast overgrowth that we have got candida for example then we're going to potentially crave a, a lot more sugar um, and it may be that you know you're in that trapped in that vicious circle where it's the yeast that for you is, is causing that um, infection is causing you a flare um, but then once you're in the flare um, you're in the flare because your yeast's gone up but if your yeast has gone up then you're going to crave the sugars um, and that's what happens and it's quite interesting because you know as an example of that just to put it into some context you know we'll have ladies who are doing really well fantastic all sorted and then typically over the years we get an email following the whole day following Christmas and say oh I was doing so well, I don't know what happened. And I, I seem to be having a flare of my symptoms again. And I'll say, okay, how much wine did you drink over Christmas? How many chocolates did you eat? You know, so it's, you can see those patterns in, in real life scenarios where, you know, we, we all unwittingly do forget, I suppose, and just do things and, and it triggers the symptoms back up again. But yeah, sugar is hugely relevant and sweeteners as well. You know, we, um, so so the, the idea of diet drinks is a nonsense. Um, you know, they cause their own problems because sweeteners, just to make sure people understand this, also feed um, the bad guys in the gut. And even the BMJ have written articles on that. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that they do compromise the gut as well. You mentioned earlier at the beginning of the interview that certain fruits may not be a great idea. Is that because of the sugar content or something else? can be um but also with with fruits i mean some people can have issues with fructose and that's that's an argument for another time because that's another uh, rabbit hole to go down but the other thing is that if we have for example uh, very very commonly ladies with SIBO small intestine bacterial overgrowth then in in those instances what happens is if you've already got an overgrowth of bacteria and then you eat foods that are high in those FODMAPs, um, then we, that will aggravate. It's like adding oxygen onto the flames. It will just feed the problem. 
So we want to try and um, reduce FODMAPs. So for somebody with SIBO, we would be doing a low FODMAP diet for a little while. Um, so a classic there would be an apple, which is a high FODMAP as a fruit. So we'd want to reduce FODMAPs um, for a while and, and until we, we have some recovery, we have some healing and we've reduced the bacteria. Um, then, and then we can add them back in again. So sometimes, yes, the you know, sugars can have other, other issues. That question comes up a lot about adding food back in. How long do you usually have to restrict something before you can start to experiment again? I think that depends on every individual. And, and the trouble is because there are so many things that feed into UTI <clears throat> that it's absolutely impossible to answer because it's mm -hmm. always going to be different. Plus the fact that, um, you know, to contextualize it again, they're not just coming with their UTI. They're coming with an entire medical history of other things. Um, and that's where we, we need to um, help them navigate that from a dietary point of view and think, well, for this individual, these are going to be longer term eliminations, whereas for other people, they can introduce back a little bit more quickly. But also when we think about the damage to the microbiome, it, it depends on all the factors. Um, that are affecting that, not just drug medication, but stress, low stomach acid, and, and so many more. So it's lots of things that we have to consider um, in, in making that decision, but it's an impossible one to navigate because it's so individual. Mm -hmm. On the topic of blood sugar levels, does an increased or elevated blood sugar level mean an association with UTI? And is there an association between UTI and diabetes? Absolutely, there is. Um, and as I said before, we see the sugars are feeding the bad guys. So uh, we're thinking about um, trying to support optimal immunity and recovery. And we want to be feeding the good bacteria uh, across the board. So if we're, if we're giving sugars, then you can imagine we're, we're jumping straight in with both feet to that compromise scenario. And so high blood sugar absolutely is a link. And that is, is known about as well, documented in diabetes circles as well, that you know, we will see more UTIs, we'll also see more thrush. Um, so yeah, anything where we're, we're having a, a greater sugars in the diet and processed foods, then by default, we're, we're gonna be having that problem. And obviously when we think of, of diabetes, then um, obviously thinking about uh, type two diabetes where, you know, by default, that is around very much around diet and lifestyle factors. There are other factors as well, but those are the main ones. And this is where we're seeing much greater rates in recent decades um, of type two diabetes because of the diet that, that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly that is, that is pushing us just jumping in with both feet into the potential for um, issues with UTI because we've got that problem uh, with, the, with the sugars there and we're going to have that imbalance with the bacteria. Mm -hmm. Do you believe there's an association between being overweight and recurrent or chronic UTI? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really the same situation, the same scenario that if we, uh, you know, there are lots of reasons for being overweight. Obviously, diet is, is a big part of that, but not just diet. There are other factors, complex endocrine issues and so on. The other thing is that, you know, food sensitivities themselves, if someone doesn't know they have food sensitivities and they keep eating those foods they're sensitive to, then um, that can drive weight gain because it causes inflammatory response, but it also um, causes fluid retention. It also causes us to crave and often the very foods that we're intolerant to, which again gets us trapped in that, in that vicious cycle. And if we have yeast overgrowth, as I mentioned before, then... Um, that's going to cause us to crave sugar. So unwittingly, we're diving into the sugar and we just can't stop ourselves because that yeast is, is, is calling for that. So there are lots of scenarios that people, without realizing it, get themselves caught up in, um, which promote the weight gain, but also would then feed into the problems with, um, with UTI. So yeah, we do see those things going together. And equally, you know, if someone's had lots of damage to the gut, through no fault of their own, because they've had lots of infections, tonsillitis, UTIs, ear infection, chest infections, sinus problems. There are many reasons for taking antibiotics. And if since childhood, someone's had very high exposure, then by default, they're gonna have 
leaky gut, they're going to be reacting to those foods um, that um, uh, cause that problem that we mentioned earlier. Um, and that then will drive weight gain as well. So the, again, those people are, are trapped in that vicious cycle. And this is where, you know, the functional medicine approach is so important because it's back to looking at all of the root causes, all the contributing factors. Still on the topic of irritants, we had a few questions about environmental factors. So one of them was whether chemicals in household cleaners or pesticides or mold might be associated with bladder symptoms. Absolutely, that's a really interesting one. <clears throat> and uh, moles are definitely found in urine. And one of the tests that we do commonly is a test for mycotoxins. And we do find that for um, bladder inflammation, mold is a big issue. And again, it's one of those things that, you know, if you don't find any bacteria and that's not the issue, or you've dealt with the bacteria, sometimes at the end of someone's journey, it's the mold that you've still got to work on. Um, but really, this sooner rather than later, we, we need to be working on that because it is um, a major one that we do look at. It's, it's very, very common. And if someone's been living in a home where they, they've had damp, or they've had a leak or whatever, living in an older house, um, then molds can be a major problem for people. Um, and we see these with upper respiratory infections, but also with, with UTIs which and, and multiple other things, mental health, so many things. Mold has become a huge topic in functional medicine and it actually drives many many conditions autoimmune disease um, so that's a massive topic in its own right and very interesting one but um, certainly Ruth with her clients has been working on mold for many many years mm -hmm. um, but it's it's very relevant the other one I would pick out there is pesticides um, because again we can see pesticides in the urine you know if you if basically if you've eaten a, a diet which is the, the normal diet which isn't organic you're going to have high exposure to to pesticides um, and that would be then passed through the urine so I think that you know trying to again we talk about sort of clean eating part of that is is eating foods that are more organic so that you're avoiding those unnecessary chemicals um, which again damage the microbiome because you're taking something that's an antimicrobial but if you're taking these awful chemicals then that's going to be very compromising um, indeed. So we definitely don't want that. We also lose nutrient value in foods when we don't eat organics. So there's another benefit, but the best way for people to approach that, and especially because people say, oh, well, I would eat organic, but it costs more or whatever. Um, I think if you look at the Environmental Working Group online, EWG, you will find a list of the dirty dozen, which are the foods mm -hmm. that are the highest in pesticides and the clean 15, which are the lowest in pesticides. So I think if people use that as a guide, it will help to manage costs when going shopping. Um, if you know the, the major troublemakers and you try and avoid those, that will certainly make a big difference. And again, will reduce inflammation as well. So um, yeah, that's a good one. The other one's not as much um, because um, they're more processed through the liver, um, not especially through you know affecting the, the kidney and the bladder. But I think, again, you know, when it comes to lots and lots of chemicals that we're exposed to, um, and especially if you think about women's toiletries and things, obviously, you know, if you're using chemicals in toiletries in the bath or using things down below, then as people know, they can cause their own problems, they can change the pH. So you, again, it's about going clean, being sensible with all these things um, and trying to use things that are as natural as possible and, and non-chemical, that would be really helpful. Um, and the other, oh yeah, the other thing I was going to mention was um, if you are using, um, you know, let's say moisturizers, makeups, um, personal care products that are not organic and that are not clean, um, then those parabens and phthalates, etc., that are contained within them, they exert a xenoestrogen effect, and that then can compromise our hormones. And many of the ladies that we see are already in that scenario of having. You know, multiple other conditions where the, the hormones are already affected. So we really want to um, avoid those sorts of things and just go to more, again, clean living regarding organic moisturizers or whatever it might be, but trying to make better choices where, where you can, where cost allows that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cost is a bit of a factor. So it's good to get some tips on that. There's one more question on environmental factors, which comes up 
more than some people might expect, which is that some people report that they get a UTI always when they're in one place and not in another. So maybe in one town where they live part time and not in another town where they live the rest of the time. Do you have any possible explanations for that? Yeah, it's an interesting one that. I mean, my first thoughts on that would be the water is slightly different, the pH is different, mm -hmm. perhaps the purity of the water changes, these sorts of things. Also, habits change when we go to a different place. You know, obviously, if you are on holiday, as we mentioned before, you might be more likely to eat a certain food or drink some wine that you wouldn't do at home when you would routine. So routines change. And so sometimes, you know, if you say that to people, like, oh, yeah, actually, I, I didn't think of that. I, I do do different things when I'm away um, or I don't take all my supplements with me when I'm away or whatever. So there's lots of those sorts of practical things. But I mentioned this one to Ruth to ask her if she had any information on this. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, um, I made a note of something which she noted from Professor Malone Lee, mm -hmm. who suggested that movement, if you are moving when you are traveling, then the vibration from that can actually cause um, a release of the biofilms. So if you are breaking down the biofilms, then you know, you're going to potentially release those pathogens and then have an aggravation of symptoms. That's certainly one I never would have thought of in a million <laughs> years. Um, so it, it's quite an interesting one from Professor Nibble of all people, but nevertheless, it, it could be relevant that, you know, it is just the movement when you're flying, sitting in a car for a long journey um, is, is enough to aggravate such a thing. Um, so that's another possibility. But I think it's one of these that probably there are multiple potential <laughs> reasons for it. Yeah, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, and interesting that so many people have reported something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I guess as well, if you found out where the particular problems are, you know, if you had the time to plot it on a map and yeah. see which areas were particularly problematic and see if there's any kind of uh, interesting patterns there, um, that would be good as well. But yeah, it is definitely a possibility. I think as well, stress, you know, um, sometimes feel, people feel better when they're on holiday because they're less stressed um, and more stressed because they're at work, but at home or whatever. So there's, there, there's so many things that come and go in this story. <laughs>